the interesting result was the mortality pattern. So during the peak silence period, we saw around 7% mortality in uh, antibiotic group, and we saw around 35% mortality in symbiotic group, which is like huge. But one week after the challenge, the mortality in antibiotic group was still 7%, but in uh, symbiotic group, there was only 1% mortality. So this indicates that the antibiotic was able to handle the sudden infection in very good way. But the symbiotic failed to compete with the sudden infection. Welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. I'm your host today, Kelly Wamsley, and I'm joined by Vikas Shah. How are you, Dr. Wamsley? I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for thanks for asking. Okay, so Vikas, um, let's talk a little bit about your master's um, research. And so you did two different research trials with broilers, and in one of the projects, you were looking at um, the role of symbiotics in helping to reduce um, subclinical necrotic enteritis. And then in the second trial, you were looking from more of a clinical necrotic enteritis um, challenge model, right? Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the two trials and um, maybe the differences between them and what you measured first? In my both of the trials, I went with the performance parameters. I accessed a lesion score. Then we looked after some of the immunological parameters such as like CD4 and CD8 T cells, regulatory T cells. We also did some of the in vitro assays, uh, which includes like nitric oxide production by macrophages. And then we also looked uh, into the gene expression of several inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. Gotcha. You started sampling um, after the challenge or right before you challenged the bird? Uh, we even compared before challenge. Okay. And so then I imagine, um, so before the challenge, did you see any differences between treatments? Uh, no. Okay. Interesting. So then, um, then you, you introduced the challenge into the birds mm -hmm. and then you started to see some differences. Can you explain some of those differences that you observed? Uh, while looking into the performance parameters, uh, the one, important one is FCR because the symbiotic decreased the FCR, which was like uh, worthy not taking. Mm -hmm. And then uh, symbiotic supplementation also decreased the lesion score significantly, which is also one of the plus point. And then we saw the rise of uh, inflammatory immune cells, that is CD4 T cells, and another cytotoxic T cells, which is CD8 T cells. And we uh, and they both were increased during the peak challenge period. And the one week after the challenge, uh, it was reduced. But when we talk about regulatory T cells, it was decreased during the peak challenge period. So that's what, so that like the body is not trying to suppress the immune system. And one week later, during the recovery phase, the T-Rex was increasing, which indicates the like T-Rex was trying to clear the uh, immune cells, inflammatory immune cells, and reach to the homeostasis state. Interesting. And we also saw like increase in nitric oxide production by macrophages in vitro, which even indicates that the macrophages were also playing active role in eliminating the infection by production of nitric oxide. And we also saw that uh, there was significant rise in several inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines during the infection. And it has like important role in clearing the infection. Uh, but when uh, we come to our, our second trial, uh, it was, the result was almost the same. Uh, antibiotic was slight better in performance when compared to the symbiotic, but the interesting result was the mortality pattern. So during the peak challenge period, we saw around 7% mortality in uh, antibiotic group, and we saw around 35% mortality in symbiotic group, which is like huge. But one week after the challenge, the mortality in antibiotic group was still 7%, but in uh, symbiotic group, there was only 1% mortality. 
So this indicates that the antibiotic was able to handle the sudden infection in very good way. But the symbiotic failed to compete with the sudden infection. Yeah. So from here, uh, what we can get that uh, the birds in antibiotic group literally was able to fight with the disease, whereas the birds in symbiotic group was not able to fight the disease in the first week. And in second week, uh, the birds fed with antibiotic who were not able to cope with the disease literally died, which was 7%. But in symbiotic, all the birds which were not able to fight with, uh, uh, were dead in like first week. So we literally see almost no mortality in the second week. Mm -hmm. So from here uh, we can like say that uh, our symbiotic needs to be improved so that it will be ready uh, to replace the like antibiotics in the poultry industry. Have you looked at um the combined use of the symbiotics and your antibiotic treatments? Uh, no, I haven't looked into the like combined effect of antibiotic and symbiotic, but yeah, I would like to do it in future. Um, so looking at some of the immune function parameters that you uh, measured, uh, was there anything that surprised you or anything that you would say, um, you know, is something that you definitely need to look more into? I think I have looked into like CD4 and CD8 tails, T cells, which are like conventional T cells. Sure. But later I came to know like there is something called intraepithelial lymphocytes, which are present in the like intestinal epithelium. And they are the first one to interact with all the food particles and gut microbiota and shape the uh, mucosal immune system. Hmm. So further i want to like look into the in triepithelial lymphocytes during the any challenge and see like whether the like systemic uh, t cells and intraepithelial uh, t cells shows the same pattern or not okay and so then if you see it um you know with that pattern that exists um what would that tell you so from here uh, we can get that uh the lymphocytes have very active role in clearing the infection and we can rely on uh, several nutritional immunology approach uh, to compete several infections such as necrotic enteritis and salmonella mm -hmm. and hopefully we would be able to uh, replace antibiotics from the poultry feed. Oh, very good. Interesting. And and so just um, also to kind of recap a little bit from the performance side, you know, um, because the, and it is really, I think, unique in looking at from the immune function and then on performance, because a lot of times you think about the immune function and then that's taking away energy that would, could be going into, you know, performance. Mm -hmm. um, and so you said you had improved feed conversion ratio in some of your symbiotic treatments compared at least to the control. And then sometimes um, it's either similar to your antibiotic uh, treatment or um, or better. How many points of feed conversion ratio were you able to pick up? Don't remember the points, but I can say it was around zero point seven or eight, something like that. Okay, that's that's a very extreme. <laughs> well, that, that's that, that, like I was shocked to like in body weight gain, there is like no significant difference, but in F, I can see the difference, and that was like crazy. Well, so what, what are the next steps in your research then? And where do you want to go into next? So uh, in my PhD, uh, our lab specifically looks on the intraepithelial lymphocytes, which I talked like a bit a, a moment ago. Mm -hmm. So intraepithelial lymphocytes, I think are better to look out in compared to like systemic immune cells, because as I have already mentioned, uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes are the one which saves the mucosal immunity. Like they have to deal with tons of bacteria and tons of varieties of food particles we eat. And then they have to identify them, which one is like immunogenic, which one is not immunogenic. Then they have to tolerate the non-immunogenic non one. And then they have to eliminate the harmful or immunogenic one. So I think intraepithelial lymphocytes is like so much into shaping the intestinal immune response. So currently we are looking the uh, ro 
role of uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes in several challenge model. And at the beginning of this year, we published uh, one article in which we characterize several intraepithelial lymphocytes, specifically, specifically the natural ones. And we saw the rise in natural intraepithelial lymphocytes during cell uh, necrotic enteritis challenge. And we again then did the same uh, experiment during the salmonella challenge and we saw the same pattern. So uh, now I am like more into the IELs that is like intraepithelial lymphocytes. And yeah, we also reported two natural intraepithelial lymphocytes in the chicken for the first time. Oh, wow. But it has only been studied in humans and mice, but in poultry, it was like still a mystery. And in humans and poultry, those cells have very active role in immune cell homeostasis, as well as regulating the immune function. So uh, now we are uh, trying to see if those cells are playing the same role in chickens or different. So we are now uh, designing study to see its function. Oh, that's really interesting. And so um, what do you, what, what kind of assay is it whenever you're looking at those intraepithelial lymphocytes? So we are basically sampling the ileum section mm -hmm. and then we, uh, extract the intraepithelial lymphocytes and then we do flow cytometry okay to see the presence of cells using like different cell markers i've gotcha and if people want to look up more on um at least the first publication and um some of the publications that you mentioned on the intraepithelial lymphocyte um mm -hmm. where should they look for those publications at uh, you can find you can google it you can go through my uh, google scholar profile or uh, LinkedIn profile or <laughs> perfect. Great. Well, um, I guess coming into a closing, um, what do you think would be a take home in, uh, our listeners and, and, uh, of this podcast? So what I want to say is like working with poultry is not as easy as it seems. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, when we talk about like other species like cow or for example, humans, you can do a uh, nutritional in intervention. Like for me, if I get suffering from some massive disease, I just want to get recovered. Nobody cares I, whether I'm lean, I'm weak or whatever is going with me. I just want to stay alive. But in terms of chickens, uh, it's not possible because they are I won't say the lifespan, but uh, they reach their market is at like 40 to 50 days. So we just have that time period. And we do a lot of immune intervention. Then as you have already mentioned, the, a lot of energy will be going towards like clearing the infection and all of the energy will be utilized by immune cells. And ultimately we cannot get the proper body weight, mm. which is the performance and which ultimately matters. Even if like you uh, found some like, Immune inter intervention is expensive. Another uh, one more thing I want to point is it's expensive. So if uh, it is not giving proper body weight, it would not be accepted by farmers in the poultry industry. Mm -hmm. So that's why nutritional intervention is one of the major way because you have, uh, we need some kind of like nutritional intervention, which can uh, modulate and regulate immune system as well as provide energy to the body which take care of their performance too. So I think uh, collaborating nutrition and immunology is one of the best way to deal with uh, these types of like infectious uh, disease or gut health in chickens. And uh, if I want to say something about symbiotic, then I would obviously say that we need to blend some more uh, probiotic bacteria, we need to blend some more selective prebiotic so that we can get more optimum results uh, during the like intestinal infection. Okay, great. And so do you have, um, I guess, a, on, on some of the, the probiotics and, and prebiotics that you mentioned on adding more of, well, do you have any, um, any ones that you might be specifically interested in? So specifically, uh, instead of like, uh, there are two things. One is a species and one is a strain. Mm -hmm. So what I think we should also be looking for the better strain, like, because 
if in pathogenic bacteria we have like the strain which cause subclinical and we have the strain same bacteria but different strain which causes like clinical so there should be like some strain available uh in the like poultry gut we might get it from the poultry gut uh, which will give us better results so we still need to work on them and uh, that's one of my future plan let's see still i am like working i'm learning <laughs> I think we all are. So, um, but that's, it's an exciting field. And uh, obviously this is an important challenge for an opportunity um, within our industry. And um, it's important too, because we definitely want to make sure that the welfare of the birds is, uh, is there and is improved and um, that the birds are healthy. And then the, you know, the meat in the long run is healthy and the birds are efficient at the same time. Um, and so, I think it's it's fascinating that the approach that you're taking and combining in, um, you know, all these different metrics that you're looking at, not just live performance, but also looking at immune function um, to really look at the mode of action and try to also be able to use that information to shape, you know, the recommendations and either, you know, modifying some of these products um, and, and getting us more and more information um, about the birds and their immune function and maybe the microbiome as well. And so, um, you know, that's that's a big area and of opportunity uh, too. So, well, thank you so much, Vickis. Appreciate your time today. And thank you so much to our listeners out there. Um, this is another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. We'll catch you next time. Thanks, bye.